there and welcome once again to our Bible studies, uh, our program In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're blessed that you can be with us once again. Amen. Uh, and really hope that you can participate. And the way you can participate is by going to our Facebook page, facebook.com mm -hmm. in slash In Search of Christianity. And that's the place that you can write to us with your, your questions, your comments, and, you know, just so we can get in touch with one another and be in touch with one another. We are the family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm kind of been looking forward to this particular study. And in a way, <laughs> dreading this particular study. But we'll see why. But before we start, I'm going to ask Brother Mark uh, to ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, you're called faithful and true in your word, Amen. Lord, yes, yeah. and we're thankful for it. Thank you, Jesus. And it also says that if we study your word, you're faithful to reveal your word and your wisdom towards us. Lord, we ask that now. Just reveal you to us. Amen. Amen. So, Alice and Mark and I are just glad to be with you again, as I said. And I, I want to talk, I've said this before, okay? This is a serious program, a serious study for people who are serious about their relationship with the living God, yes. serious about the Word of God, serious about finding and being in that place that is pleasing to God. We talked last week, we talked about ministry, ministry as the expression of love within the body of Christ. And I've mentioned, I mentioned last in the last program, and I think one or two others, um, something from Acts chapter 6, and I want to get into that a little bit today. But I want to start by saying that in this program, In Search of Christianity, the foundational premise has been that, <clears throat> that real Christianity, true Christianity, is exhibited in Jesus, Amen. in his life, yes. and defined by his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Okay? His training of believers continued throughout his life here on, you know, walking on the earth, mm -hmm. both in word and in deed, until the day of Pentecost, because that follows his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. Mm -hmm. And right after that, the day of Pentecost, that is the first spirit-led, power-filled sermon about the word of the cross and about the fulfillment of the, the promise of the Messiah mm. through Jesus Christ. So let's, let's start with that premise, okay? That Christianity is based on the, the life of Jesus Christ and the teaching of Jesus Christ. That should be a simple fact for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. So using simple logic then, if Christianity today does not look like Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, then it's going off course. Okay? Absolutely. And if, obviously, if I'm doing a study on in search of Christianity, I, I think that it doesn't. I'm, I'm saying, you know, I look around as we travel in the many places that we have, and I don't see what I believe to be true biblical faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I want to start by saying, somebody said this, and it's been attributed to a few people, and I'm not sure who actually said it, and this may even be a bit of a paraphrase, but Christianity started as a fellowship in Jerusalem, right. okay? It became a philosophy in Greece, mm -hmm. it became a culture in Rome, and then it became an enterprise in the United States, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that's a valid statement, and I, I think, so that means that it's, it's made a transition. Right. It's gone from this to that to this to that. It's been changing. Right. And that's a downward position. Well, re yeah, I mean, there's supposed, supposed to be change in our lives. Right. 
Because the calling of God, as Paul says, is an upward calling. Mm -hmm. And the promise of God is to bring us from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. So change is supposed to be taking place in our lives. So we've talked about this in, the, in a few of the previous programs. Yes. But the fact that change is taking place in our lives doesn't mean that change should be taking place in Christianity. Right. Because the Word of God is unchanging. That's right. And Jesus Christ is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. So the change that's taking place in my life, your life, our lives, through the work of the Holy Spirit, should not be changing what Christianity is. Right? Right. <clears throat> it should be conforming to it. A absolutely. Right. We're supposed to be, we're not supposed to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that day by day we become more and more like Jesus, right? Okay, <clears throat> so if there's a change taking place, and obviously there's a change taking place, mm -hmm. okay, then that's going off course. Yes, yeah. That's what you know, a, a couple of years ago over in, in Kenya, East Africa, I was asked to teach in a seminary, I was asked to teach a class to pastors on church history. And I, it became obvious that their expectation was that I would go through, you know, history, the time of history, and maybe time in the time of Constantine, into the Dark Ages, into the Middle Ages. But church history, if you're going to study church history, you need, no, you need go no further than the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Because that's where all of the seeds of the change that's taken place in the church are obvious, okay? Right. The detrimental change of the church. Well, bear in mind the fact that, you know, Paul says, writing to Timothy, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, you know, that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Mm -hmm. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Yes. Look at the letters in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. They're mostly there for correction. Right. Okay, they are for training in righteousness. They are for encouragement. But letter after letter after letter is dealing with correction that needs to take place. Mm -hmm. Correction because something has gone askew. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And those seeds of the, the things that have gone askew in the early church are the things that manifest more and more as we go through time. Yes. You know, if you get on a boat here in the United States and you start heading for Europe, mm -hmm. Let's say I'm, I'm going from Florida to England, which we've done many times, as a matter of fact. And you, your course is off by a couple of degrees. Mm -hmm. By the time you've traveled three, 4,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, you'd be, you'd be so far off the mark, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You better be prepared to speak Swahili instead of speaking, well, the Queen's English, yeah. right? Yeah. So things have been going off, and, and there's no doubt about that. So I want to talk about, I mean, we could look at times, the early 4th century, in the time of Emperor Constantine. Um, that, that is a major transitional time in the history of the church. And I would argue, not, not for the better, but for the worse, okay? I would talk about, uh, in, in the early 1500s, Martin Luther, where there is a massive course correction, mm -hmm. taking us back towards faith in Christ and re reliance on the Word of God, okay? But change happens in baby steps. Yes. Sometimes change no, no, happens. Change always happens in baby steps. A little bit at a time. I'm, I'm gonna, it, it, the problem is, more often than not, we don't see those small steps. We're oblivious to them because they don't have major impact. You know, right. as they, as you go along, but all of a sudden, you know, you wake up one day and things have changed. Right. I mean, I can give you all the worldly examples. Look at, you know, World War II in, in the United States. Pearl Harbor, pow, happened in an instant on a Sunday morning mm -hmm. in, in December of 1941, December 7th, 1941. Happened in an instant. It did not happen in an instant. It's been building up. Oh, my goodness. It was building up politically. It was building up militarily. Yes. Japan had been preparing for war, arming itself, building its armament. They had been aggressive on the mainland with China. I mean, you know, the signs were all there. It, it, it was a little bit, a little bit. Same thing in, in Europe with Hitler. Okay? You know, Hitler's Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is like this instantaneous attack on it's Poland. lightning fast yeah. war. Well, the only thing about that lightning fast war, which I understand the attack was, that had been building up. 
and Hitler had made evident for years. They had railroad tracks stopping right at the border. And the people on the other side of the border were saying, what's these for? That's my point. So, you know, it looks like, okay, this event happened in an instant and everything changed. But if you look at historically, the steps had been there, one step at a time, line upon line, precept upon precept. It had been building up. And it's the same, that's why I'm saying, you know why? Because if Christianity is supposed to be constant, and the enemy of Christianity is the enemy of our souls, that old serpent from the garden. Mm-hmm. The first revelation of the serpent is he was more crafty, more subtle than any other beast of the field. Mm-hmm. Okay? It happens little by little. So if you were to look, and this is what I want to do. I, I want to spend some time, and it will probably be well beyond this one particular program, maybe for the next two or three programs. And if, you, if you look at... Acts chapter 2, for example, all right? Yes. So this is right after, okay, Acts chapter 1, Jesus has ascended into heaven, all right? Mm-hmm. And he tells the disciples to stay in Jerusalem until power comes upon them. And power comes upon them, when? Well, in Acts chapter 2, it says, all those who had believed together had all things in common. This is The day of Pentecost happened, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And then the first thing you see is that all of the believers... They were together and had all things in common. Okay, in other words, there is true unity in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked about it here before. There are over 30,000 some odd denominations in Christianity together today, right? Well, how do you go from having this unity, a real unity, to being divided into 30,000 different denominations? It didn't happen overnight. It happened little by little by little, okay? But they, it says in, in Acts chapter 2, I'm, I'm going to read verse 44 to 47. All those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, praise God. Mm-hmm. There's the church as it appears it should be. As it should be working. Right? Yes. Now, if you go to Acts 4, you find a similar situation, mm-hmm. all right, where it says that there was no need among them. But there was a subtle change. It seemed that the role of the apostles changed slightly to include more administrative duties on behalf of the apostles. Mm -hmm. Because now, instead of me seeing a brother in need and taking care of it, you know, I'm taking what abundance I have and giving it to the apostles, who are then managing the distribution of that abundance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a slight change. change. And then you get to Acts chapter 6. Now, last week we talked about ministry. And ministry is the heart of Christianity on this planet. And I'm not talking about the fivefold ministry, because if you saw that program last week, and if you didn't, please go see it. Right? It is about the fact that every Christian has a ministry. Yes. We are the ministers of God on this planet. We are all, you know, those ambassadors for Christ. Acts chapter 6 is a significant change. Acts chapter 6 in the, in the history of the church may be the most significant thing that happens up until that point. All right? Could that be a paradigm shift? It is a paradigm shift. All right? That's, uh, the honeymoon is over. Yeah. Well, it, because something so significant happens. Now, I want to tell you, you know, I've, I've been studying the Word for about 40 years. I've read lots of commentaries, although, you know, God keeps telling me, listen to what I have to say to you. But every commentary that I've read on Acts chapter 6 talks about and applauds what the church did here, right? One commentary talks about the successful growth of the church and states that this success leads to an overload for the apostles in their administration of the common fund for the poor, okay? Another says providing assistance to the widows was taking time away from the apostles' main assignment of preaching the word. They acted immediately and decisively. 
A third says it was really just an emulation of love, each party wishing to have their own poor taken care of in the best manner. And another says, and wisdom given by the Spirit meets the difficulty, profiting by the occasion to give development to the work, according to the necessities that were growing up. All of these commentaries agree that Acts chapter 6 records a good development, a spirit-led structuring of the organization of the church, creating and defining offices within the body, primarily to free the apostles for their ministry. They all agree. I strongly disagree. I incredibly strongly disagree. Now, I want to say, going into this, I want to say, first of all, Psalm 119, verse 165, says, that, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Okay? Don't get offended by what I say. Test what I say. Don't test it by what your church does, what your denomination does, what you feel. Test it by the Word of God. Standard. That has to be our standard, all right? And it's interesting you said that because as I was first reading this, now at the time when the, did the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose as part of the hell the Hellenistic Jews. A complaint arose. Okay. Somebody was griping. Okay. Somebody took offense. Yes, that's what I want to talk about. And they okay. solved it in a world, a spiritual problem, in a worldly manner. That's what I want to talk about too. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you're right. That's, but that's exactly what I want to talk about. Um, I, I want to make it clear that what I'm going to talk about is not what I see as judgment on the apostles. All right. Mm -hmm. We are all fallible. Yes. Paul, who has to be the most brilliant, quote-unquote, theologian, although that's a scary word, among all the apostles, said he hadn't reached the perfection yet. Okay? He was the greatest among sinners. When, when we see Jesus Christ eyeball to eyeball, face to face, we shall be changed. We shall be as he is. Then we will have achieved perfection. Prior to that time, trust me, you can be wrong. Yes. I know that I have, I can be wrong. That's why it's so important that we have fellowship. That's why I'm saying it's so important that if you see that, that or believe that something I'm saying is not correct, don't, don't let it slide. Write to me. Get on Facebook and leave a comment, all right? Because I, I, I recognize I'm going to be wrong, and I will, I will test it. You know, if somebody says, hey, you're wrong about this, I will go, I, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say, Hey, do you know who I am? Do you know who you're talking I'm going to go check and test it, all right? We have to get to that place. Do you believe that, like, for example, Peter could possibly make a mistake? <laughs> Did you ever read the New Testament? Like Galatians? <laughs> well, anywhere. I mean, you know, this is, this is Peter. No, you don't wash my feet. Yeah. This is Peter. Oh, no, you're not going to the cross. This is Peter. Get takes out of so. I mean, yes, we can all make mistakes, all right? Just because something is written in Scripture doesn't mean that that's God's stamp of approval upon it. That's right. And I hope that you're mature enough to have been able to see that in your own studies of the Word, right? So I do. I want to get into Acts chapter 6 because I said this is so important in the life of the church, in the history of the church, because this is where a significant change in direction happens. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's look at it. I'm going to start Acts chapter 6, verse 1, that Mark just mentioned, right? It says, Now, at this time when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily soothing of, fur, of, of food. The disciples were increasing in number. Now, bear in mind that the, the apostles, the disciples, they had been faithful in the face of persecution here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I also want to go on. It says, as the disciples were increasing in number. I want to read you two verses or refer to two verses. It's the Word of God. Back in Exodus, it talks about the, the people of God. It says, the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied. Mm -hmm. You want church growth? Persecution is the best tool there is. It always has been. They said of the early church, it was nourished, it was, it was fertilized by the blood of the martyrs. 
you afflict us and praise God, people see, you know, that they see Christ in us because that's when he comes, you know, is most visible. So the more they were, the more they grew, the more they were afflicted, the more they grew. How whomsoever, later on, speaking of that time, God speaks through Hosea and says, the more they multiplied, the more they sinned. That's just a fact. These are facts. So I want to ask you a question. I want to go into this. Why do congregations grow? And the answer, simply put, is that people come into the quote-unquote church for one of three reasons. They will always come in for one of three reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, because Christ is exalted. He is lifted high and lifted up, and men are drawn to him. The second reason is people are drawn into the church by something in the natural that is attractive to the natural man. We're going to look at all these more closely, right? But the third reason is, this is, and we're going to test these scripturally, people come into the church because they are there to bring destruction. Okay? The church world today, particularly in the West, is filled with church growth seminars, with congregational leaders often paying a lot of money, from the ties, of course, to attend these seminars, right? There are even businesses that specialize in consulting, teaching churches how to build their congregations into ever larger organizations. They come on in and they'll do consulting work and they'll, they'll suggest a more attractive, a larger building, a more modern logo, hiring a better band to play worship, getting more relevant for young people, all too often meaning becoming more and more like the world. That's a, this, mm -hmm. Listen, if you don't know that, if you don't believe it, you're being naive. Yes. Okay, I mean, I know of congregations where, where they hire consultants, and the consultant came in and said, well, told the pastor he should grow a goatee because it'll make him more, look more youthful and more relevant. Okay. The first reason for church growth is good. Yes. It is the good, all right? Because Christ is exalting. The Spirit of life is there. From the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled those gathered with his power, the church proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, it says in Acts 2.41. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved, Acts 2.47. Of course, Jesus said it in John chapter 12, verse 32. He said, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. When the word of the cross is boldly pro proclaimed, that's what happens. Why? This is the word of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the cross. That's the good. You know, we have a, a dear brother here in Central Florida, who is a pastor of a church in a denomination. Um, he's a spirit-filled Pentecostal <laughs> pastor in a very non-spirit-filled denomination. And that denomination is in steep decline uh, throughout the Southeast U.S. and in most places in the world that I know of, right? So the but his church continues to have be vibrant, alive, and have growth in it, right? So the denomination headquarters keeps asking him about what programs he's running that are resulting in this growth. And he tells them, I just keep preaching Jesus. And they keep saying, yeah, but what kind of programs are people responding to? No and again, he says, I preach Christ and him crucified. The, the denomination is looking for a program yes. when the answer is a person. Jesus. The denomination is concerned about their increasingly empty buildings. Leonard Ravenhill, a, a, a man whose ministry I admire greatly. Uh, he was born in Leeds, England. I think he died here in the U.S. and uh, Probably, well, not terribly long ago, but, but some time ago. And he had a heart for revival. 
and was a great student of God's mighty movings in revivals. And he said, what God wants is not to fill up empty pews. He is not concerned about filling empty churches. He is concerned about filling empty hearts and empty lives and empty eyes that have no vision and empty hearts that have no passion and empty wills that have no purpose. What a brilliant statement. God will not bless a heart that's only concerned with building our own little kingdoms on the corner. All right? He is concerned with the people that, that it's not even in the building. Okay? And another pertinent point that we to ponder, and this is something you should consider, and we may do this in greater detail at a later time, is that even those who are drawn to the Father, right? John 6, 44, and come out of death and enter into this new life, much like Lazarus, are still bound by the old grave clothes, the old ways of thinking, the old traditions of men, the old habits. And as with young children, they need training and instruction. For the, we all come into this world newborn and ignorant. Right? So true. Yeah. I was, I was going to say stupid, but that might have offended you. But that's, a, that's the truth. Whether it offends you or not, it's true. And what does a newborn know? He knows how to cry. I mean, he knows what he, he's screaming because of what he wants. That's why it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 2, 22, 6. So those newborn Christians over whom all the angels rejoice at their salvation, that's what it says in Luke 15, are still at best immature and as yet ignorant of, of most of the spiritual truths that are taught in the Word. And they are to be taught those truths by the shepherds that the Lord has entrusted them to. Okay? If you allow it to become about programs, about the size of your congregation, rather than the kingdom of God, then you enter into the realm of the second reason. Remember I said there are three reasons for this church growth. The second one is the bad. We're getting in. The good, the bad, and the, the ugly. good, the bad, and the ugly. The bad. Because the flesh is filled. The spirit of death. Right? Flesh is dead. In these days of the early church that we're talking about here, it was obvious that many people were in need, just like today. Yet there was one group. I mean, look at the New Testament and see all around Jerusalem, see the need that existed, the beggars, right? But there was one group, highly visible because of their spiritual boldness, in which there was no need. That's what it said in Acts 4. So people are looking, these people in need, they're looking, wow, those people don't have any need. Mm. And they're being drawn by the flesh. Yes. Jesus said it in John chapter 6, talking about the people that walked away from him at one point. He said, Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Right. There are people walking into churches today because of the coffee and donuts. Mm. I'm telling you the truth. Yes. Today, people are hungry for more self-esteem, for a healthier, wealthier lifestyle, hungry for the accoutrements of success as defined by the world. They're hungry for acceptance and approval in an ever more self-centered world, as foretold by Paul in his letter to Timothy. But realize this, in the last days, perilous times will come. All right? When men will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure. Mega churches are all too often filled with the many that Jesus spoke of that choose the wide gate and the easy way that unfortunately leads to destruction. And the third one is, if we had the good, the bad, now comes the ugly. And you know what? Come next program, we are really going to get into that. Because that's what we need to be conscious and aware of. But until then, this time just flies by. May God bless you, may he use you for his glory, and may we all encourage one another as long as it's still called today. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Hill, far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. I love that old
Of lost sinners. 